Hello and welcome back. Uh, in this exercise, we're going to begin a discussion on different measures of shape and relative location. So when we start talking about shape, we're starting to talk about shape of a distribution, uh, which we haven't had a great deal of discussion on, but you may recall if uh, we looked at those histograms, right? And there's kind of a bar graph that looked like this. And we had frequency on the y-axis and some range of values zero to, I don't know, 100 or something on that x-axis. And so this gave us some shape. Now the most common shape is sort of a bell curve like this. And we're gonna be looking in a, a much more depth in, in later segments of this series of videos on specific shapes of distribution. Uh, but that's where this discussion starts to go uh, when we're looking at measures of shape. Relative location now allows us to, to identify where a specific observation exists in a distribution relative to its mean. And so we've already talked about the mean as being that measure of central location, uh, the measure of uh, central tendency within a data set. Now we want to be able to measure the position of individual observations relative to that mean. Specifically, we're going to be able to measure it in terms of the number of standard deviations from the mean. So a standard deviation, you'll remember, was uh, that s was the square root of the variance. And so the variance, this is going to look messy, the variance was the sum of the, all these differences squared divided by n minus 1. This looks awful. I understand if you want to pretend like you never saw this formula. I know it's tedious. But this was that measure of the variance that takes into account all of the available information in that data set, right? Unlike the range, which only looks at the smallest and largest value, right? So these different measures of variance uh, take into account different amounts of information. The, the variance itself takes into the account the most information. Standard deviation is then just a variant of that. It's the square root of the variance. So when we look at um, relative location, we're talking about these z-scores. The formula for a z-score is uh, one of the simpler ones that we'll be working with. It's the, the difference between an individual location, or sorry, an individual observation, so xi, and i can be any one of these observations, the difference between it and the sample mean divided by uh, the standard deviation. Now this, this little formula, uh, it, it might look simple, and it, it hopefully it is, but it is very important in the sense that we're going to see it a lot in later, later segments of this, um, this series of videos. This, this notion of relative location becomes extremely important uh, later on as we get into more complex um, concepts such as uh, hypothesis testing and things like this. So what I want you to, to keep in mind at this point, when we start talking about these z-scores, what we're doing is almost transcribing one data set to another. So I want you to imagine, if you will, that we're working with two distributions simultaneously. Okay? We're working with the one distribution that exists in this data set. So here I have, uh, this is my sample, this is my CO2 per capita. And it has a mean 7.6, so that's somewhere in the middle. And I have a variance of 2.7 which describes you know, the spread of, of observations within that data set. Now, what we're going to be working with simultaneously is a Z distribution. And when I say we're transcribing, what I mean is for every value that exists in this distribution, any value xi, there exists a corresponding z value. And that's exactly what this formula is doing. 
we're, we're changing a, a value from the data set and we're transcribing it, we're copying it over to its corresponding value within that Z distribution. So for the mean, if I were to put in our mean value here, that numerator becomes zero. So the Z score that corresponds with our mean is always going to be zero. So what do these Z scores mean? Well, again, this is a discussion on relative location. A Z score, quite literally, allows us to say that observation observation xi, whatever observation that is, is z standard deviations from the mean. So it allows us to state quite specifically how far a particular observation is from the mean in terms of the nature of the variation within that data set. Okay, so at this point that might still sound a little bit convoluted, a little bit strange, but as I said, this is a concept that's going to come back again and again and again and again. So you'll get lots of practice with it and you'll hear it um, quite a bit as, uh, as we progress through the material. Okay, so let's, let's get into our our exercises here. Uh, let's see, here I've got I've got my sample mean. What we need is our standard deviation. So the formula is going to be, I'm going to substitute in individual values for xi. Our mean is 7.6 divided by, I need our standard deviation, which I need a calculator. So our standard deviation is going to be, uh, let's see, 2.7 square root, so one, let's round it to 1.6. And now I can just substitute in our value. So let's, let's start with uh, Sweden. So here's our first observation, here's Sweden. So that's a value here of 5.6. So let me clean this up a little bit. So let's substitute in here our value of interest, 5.6. And now we can obtain the z-score, 5.6 minus 7.6 divided by standard deviation, 1.6. So negative 1.25. So here's our z-value. I had Sweden, here was 5.6. That gives us a Z value negative 1.25. So that observation is one and a quarter or 1.25 standard deviations below the mean. I know it's below because it's negative. Okay, our next observation. Let's change color here. Let's go to Greece, blue. Greece, well, Greece is 7.6. So that's exactly our mean. If I put 7.6 in here, the numerator is zero. So let's change our color. So this zero is now blue for Greece. So Greece is zero standard deviations from the mean. So Greece is uh, exactly equal to the mean value. Uh, next one, Denmark. So Denmark will be green. This is 8.3. So 8.3 minus 7.6 divided by 1.6. So this is, let's round it to 0.44, whoops. Zero point forty four. So that's 0 0.44 standard deviations from the mean. And finally, the Netherlands. So this is 11. And, oops. 11 minus 7.6 divided by 1.6 again. 2 point, let's say 2.1. So we're somewhere up here. 2.1 standard deviations from the mean. There, so that's as simple as that. Now, it, it, uh, it looks easy, 
and it, it, hopefully it is easy. The interpretation of these z values is nothing more than what I've been saying. Some particular value, so Netherlands is here, and Denmark was here. Each of these observations corresponds to a z-score that allows us to say it's so many standard deviations from the mean. So that's its relative location from the mean value. Okay, let's, uh, let's carry on. Part B. Part B. Whoops. I want an eraser. Identify any countries that appear to be outliers using the first and third quartiles and the interquartile range. Okay, this one. Now we need a little bit more information. We need to calculate our first and second quartile and our interquartile range and identify outliers. So an outlier will be an observation that is smaller than the first quartile minus 1.5 times the interquartile range and larger than the third quartile plus one and a half times the interquartile range. So this, these are simple rules for identifying outliers. All of that means is that it might be a particularly interesting observation or, or perhaps it's even a mistake. And while an outlier is, is a, a specific observation that seems to be a long ways away from the mean. Uh, it's well outside of the group uh, of the other observations. So this is really just a rule of thumb. It's one measure, one way of spotting the possibility of an outlier in the data set or, or a particular observation that seems to be long ways away from all of the rest. So we need to find our first and third quartiles. So we can use this using our index P over 100 times uh, our sample size. So the first one, uh, first quartile will be 25, and we have 10 observations. So this will be two and a half, so we round that to three. So there's my first quartile. I'm going through this quickly because we've done a few calculations of quartiles before. Our next quartile is 75 over 100 for our third quartile and that's going to be 0.75 so we round that up to 8 so there's our I'm looking at this 8 right there's our 8th observation so those represent our first quartile there's 25 percent there our third quartile there's 25 percent greater than that third quartile so the interquartile range is the difference 8.3 minus 5.9 and so let's just get that calculator up again 8.3 minus 5.9 so the IQR is 2.4 so now if I fill in our values up here so Q1 Q1 we calculated as 5.9 minus one and a half times the IQR, which was 2.4. Q3 we calculated or we determined was 8.3 plus one and a half times the IQR, which is the same 2.4. So this gives us a lower bound. Oops. 5.9 minus 1.5 times 2.4. So this is 2.3. And finally the upper bound 8.3 plus 1.5 times 2.4 11.9. So if we have an observation that is smaller than 
then that would be particularly small given the nature of this data set, given the spread of the observations in this data set. Something less than 2.3 would be considered an outlier or something larger than 11.9 also would be considered an outlier in the sense that it seems to be significantly larger than anything else uh, within that data set. So going back to our data, our smallest is 5.6, our largest is 11.9, so it looks like we have uh, no outliers in this data set. We have no observations smaller than 2, 3, and none that are larger than 11.9, so it doesn't look like we have any outliers. Okay, that was uh, a little bit longer than I intended it to be, but we got through everything. So I, I hope that helps uh, identify Z-scores relative position, uh, as well as uh, identifying outliers using the interquartile range method. Okay, thanks for watching.